Order. But, order. I draw the attention of honourable senators to the presence in the chamber of a parliamentary delegation from Ireland led by Senator Dennis O'Donovan. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to Australia and, in particular, to the Senate. Senator Macdonald. Uh, Mr President, uh, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Defence, Senator Bob Carr. Is the minister aware of reports of whether substantial cuts to uh, defence announced in the May budget have resulted in a decision to no longer supply the iconic Rising Sun badge as part of the uniform that Australian soldiers have worn since 1901? Are these reports true? Order. The Minister representing the Minister for Defence, Senator Bob Carr. Mr President, I have seen no such reports. I discount them completely, and I will seek further advice from my colleague, the Minister for Defence. Senator Macdonald. Well, Mr President, I thank the Minister for his assurance that that Rising Sun badge will continue. I ask as a supplementary, is the Minister aware of reports that soldiers from the Australian Army Reserve units have reported that they're not being given live or blank rounds for training exercises and instead are shouting bang bang to simulate weapons discharges. Is it true that the Army Reserve training days are being cut from 100 to 21 per member per financial year to ensure that available ammunition will actually meet operational needs? A minister. Mr President, I'm happy to assure the Senate that the Army advises there is no shortage of blank or live ammunition. Ammunition has not been affected by budget cuts. Army training, whether through dry drills or the use of blank or live ammunition, continues to be effective. The 2012-2013 defence budget was developed following a comprehensive review of the Department's budget to identify contributions defence could make across the forward estimates to support the government's broader fiscal strategy. The decisions taken to determine defence's contribution to the budget bottom line have all been carefully designed to protect our servicemen and women and our defence operations and to minimise the impact on core capabilities. This contribution will have no adverse effect on operations taking place, whether in Afghanistan the short answer is no, they're not, and that is the Time's Army advice. Expired. Order, 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 order. Just, just wait a minute, Senator Macdonald. There's noise on both sides. So on both, on my right, Senator Macdonald. Uh, wait, wait, wait a minute, Senator Macdonald. I, I can't give you the call because people are going across the chamber. Senator Macdonald. Mr. President, my question, which the minister didn't even attempt to answer, was. Is it true that Army training days are being cut from this is reserve training from 100 to 21 to allow for the limited ammunition to be available for operational needs? He didn't answer that question. Didn't even refer to it. Sorry, uh, just just before you do, I, I'm not clear myself. Is this a point of order? Sorry. Well, Mr. Mr. President, sorry, I did say I raise a point of order, and it's on relevance. Well, I, I, didn't, I didn't hear that, and mm -hmm. I'm, I need to check. I'll allow, I'll allow the, I will allow the point of order. Um, I believe the minister has been answering the question. If the minister has any time remaining, the minister can address the question. The, uh, Senator Macdonald. Well, uh, Mr President, again I take it from the Minister's refusal to answer that the suggestion that they go from 100 to 21 is not true, and I'm grateful for that. Uh, is the Minister aware order. of reports that 51 order. Far North Queensland Regiment, a unit with a third of its force as Indigenous Australian soldiers, engaged in conducting reconnaissance and surveillance and engaging with the community in Northern Australia, has had to cut training operations by 75 per cent due to lack of funding. Are these reports true, Minister? The order. The Minister. Mr President, I will seek further advice on the training days available to the unit he mentions, but his credibility, the credibility 
of the senator, Mr. President. No, this is not time is to argue. Rookie error. Rookie error. He has no credibility. No, it's not a order. It's not. You can answer the question, but it's not a debating time. And continue, continue, yeah. Mr. 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 President. Mr. President, he, he rested his credibility today in question time on the allegation that soldiers were required to say bang order. bang or, order. instead of firing on my bullets. right. There's a point of order, Senator Brandis. Relevance. Order. Order, Senator Brandis. Relevance. The minister has already, in effect, taken the question on notice by saying he'd seek advice. He cannot now relevantly be permitted to go on to personally attack and reflect upon the senator who put the question. Order. 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 On, on, my, on my right, Senator Evans is on his feet. Senator Evans. And on the point of order, uh, the minister is uh, 20 seconds into uh, his answer. He is, uh, he is uh, perfectly uh, entitled in answering the question to address issues raised in the question. He's uh, providing an answer to the Senate, and the situation is where the opposition continue to try and shout down and then take points of order after having sought information. And quite frankly, it makes a mockery of question time. They ought to allow the minister to complete his answer. There's no point of order. The minister has 40 seconds. Order. Senator Macdonald. Uh, Mr uh, President, on the point of order, the minister is very kindly uh, giving an answer about my credibility. I didn't ask him about my credibility. I asked him on whether the Far North Queensland Regiment order. training days are being that cut back by 75 per cent. On my right. Order. I've already ordered. There is no point of order. The minister has 40 seconds remaining. The minister, M Mr. Mr. President, he started with the absurd allegation that soldiers were required to say "bang bang" instead of firing bullets, and he's wrong. And he's wrong. And the army itself advises him, advises this house, that the allegation is absurd and entirely wrong. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, he has no credibility. He has no credibility Order. on his subsequent questions, Mr. President. I'm, I'm, Mr. He, he, he suggests, Mr. President, that the army is disposing of historic badges of enormous Order, your time significance to Australians. Time's expired. Time's expired. Senator Stevens. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Why, order. Senator Stevens. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is also to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Bob Carr. Can the minister update the Senate on the situation for women and girls in Afghanistan? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Bob Carr. President, improving the lives of women and girls around the world is a top priority for this government. It's an important feature of Australia's ambitious aid program. We have and continue to advocate for it strongly. I'm, uh, I'm proud to say that we'll be hosting UN Women's Michelle Bachelet in Australia next week, an inspirational champion for women's rights, and we're a great supporter of UN Women's work. We expect to be its second largest donor by 2015-16. Afghanistan is an example of where practical programs are making a real difference. Afghanistan remains, of course, one of the worst countries in the world to be born female. Every two hours a woman dies in the country from pregnancy-related causes. Female life expectancy has increased, but it is still only 44 years. Over 80 per cent of women, over 80 per cent of women are illiterate, and violence against women is estimated to affect over 80 per cent of women. But our assistance is beginning to make a real difference. Under the Taliban, there were virtually no girls in school. Today, there are more than 2.5 million. And we're seeing better representation in parliament. Currently, 28 per cent of parliamentarians in that country are women. So the challenges are very great, but the contribution we're making is already contributing to a better condition for girls and women in this war-torn country. I said uh, earlier that we will welcome Michelle Bachelet to Australia next week, an inspirational champion for women's rights. I expect to be able to talk to her about programs in Afghanistan where we are helping more girls to get an education, 
more women to, to deliver their babies safely, and less violence against women and girls. Mr. Stevens. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I thank the minister for his answer. But can he advise the Senate what is the Australian government doing to actually improve the situation there? The minister. Mr. President, uh, the, the Senate will appreciate that uh, Australia has a great responsibility in Uruzgan Province, where our lead role has made a difference to security outcomes. But in terms of the contribution of Australian development aid, I can report with pride, and I think every Australian is entitled to be proud of this statistic, that we have constructed 227 schools. 227 schools constructed in this province, including 39 girls' schools. They were schools not there before Australia assumed these responsibilities. They were schools that didn't exist when the Taliban ruled in Afghanistan. 500 women will participate in literacy groups. 80 per cent of women in Uruzgan will receive at least one antenatal visit. And we've trained 30 female master teachers trainers to get more women into the teaching profession. Senator Stevens. Thank you. And thank you, Mr President. Can the minister actually advise, um, particularly in relation to maternal health in the province, what, uh, what um, Australian support can offer. Minister. Mr. President, well, one very sobering indicator out of uh, Uruzgan province, and again an indicator of the poverty, the background of the whole country, is that every year around 300 mothers and 3,000 children under the age of five die. Nine out of ten women give birth at home without any skills support. Nine out of ten. Ozaid is working with Save the Children to train midwives in Uruzgan. 44 female health workers have been recruited and 25 women have enrolled in the new midwifery school. The work is already saving lives. 23-year-old Basnura was trained through this program and is now training other midwives. She's experienced the all too common problems of women and their babies dying during childbirth. She now takes joy with this training provided by Australia in saving the lives of babies, in saving the lives of mothers and in expired. teaching others to do the same. Senator Joyce. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Wong. I refer the Minister to the fact that the government's stock of outstanding debt has grown by $5 billion since the beginning of this financial year to now a gross total of $239 billion an increase of almost $180 billion in additional debt since this Labor government was elected. Can the, government, the government has promised to deliver a surplus of $1.5 billion, so can, they explain, and can the minister explain why the government has increased its borrowings by over $5 billion in the past seven weeks? Minister for Finance, Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. And, uh, thank Order. Uh, Order. I thank the senator for his question and I congratulate him on having a small win over the Liberals uh, on foreign investment. Uh, no, I don't agree with it, but uh, I congratulate him on his win. Although I did notice Mr Hockey went it back pretty hard at Senator Nash and put her in her place. So. Senator Wong. Senator Joyce. Uh, thank you, Mr President. It's obviously a question on relevance. Her answer has not dealt in any way, shape or form with the question, although she might want to address it to the Labor Party who have been rolled on their position Order. on immigration. Yeah. <laughs> um, Senator Wong, the, you have one minute forty to address the question. You should address the question that has been asked by Senator Joyce. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'm very happy to address the question, and as the senator knows, because he's asked me questions about gross debt and net debt previously, the senator would know that gross debt peaked as a percentage of GDP, uh, peaked as a percentage of GDP in 11-12. Net debt peaks as a percentage of GDP at 9.6%. Of course, this is, of course, at about one tenth of the level of the major advanced economies. Uh, we start paying down gross and net debt as a percentage of GDP uh, this year uh, and net interest payments in this financial year, according to the budget fig figures, uh, would be about half a percent of GDP. 
so uh, we've laid out our figures very clearly. Uh, they're in the budget. Uh, they are accounted for. That, of course, puts us in stark contrast to a coalition that has never once, under this economic team, including under Senator Joyce for the short period he was in this position in opposition, ever once got their costings right. Ever once got their costings right. And if you want to look, if you want to look at what uh, uh, an ABBA government would have to do in order to balance books, order. go to the home order. state of Senator the Senate, go to Queensland Senator and have Wong. a look at Premier Senator Newman. Senator Wong, resume your s order. Or uh, Senator Cormann, I draw to your attention Senator Joyce is on his feet. Senator Joyce. Thank you, Mr. President. Once Sen more, Senator Conroy. Thank you, Mr. Senator President. Joyce. Once more, it's on relevance. The question asked, Order. why has the debt gone up by $5 billion in seven weeks if there are if they're telling us they're going to have a $1.5 billion surplus by the end of the year? And she hasn't answered it. Order. The minister is answering the question. The minister has 35 seconds remaining to answer the question. The minister. Minister. Uh, well, mi Mr. President, uh, I don't know how to explain it to Senator Joyce. I don't know how to explain it to Senator Joyce. I've given him the figures on gross and net debt. Uh, I've given them to him on previous occasions. Uh, it, it is true that there is, uh, there is obviously an issue about a stock of debt. Uh, that he would be aware of. I assume that the difference between stock and flow, he is an accountant, and I'm sure he would understand that. But the relevant figures for the purposes of assessing the strength of Australia's public finances are, are, are gross and net debt position, uh, and I've outlined those, and they are the figures Time's which have expired. ensured— Time's expired, Senator Wong. Senator Joyce. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I ask the supplementary. I refer the minister to the updated NBN Co corporate plan that the government released last week, which revealed a $5 billion blowout in the net cost of the NBN. Given that the government will be required to borrow more debt to provide to the NBN, can the minister advise the Senate what the value of the outstanding Commonwealth government securities will be at the end of this financial year and at the end of the next three financial years? Order. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, uh, Mr. President, I'm happy to answer the question, but I've struggled to see how this is at all a supplementary to the question that was asked. At all a supplementary to the second question that was asked. The second, Order. Uh, I'm raising, as a matter of courtesy, I will answer. But you can't, you can't, you can't cope with that, can you? Order. But I'm Order. Su suggesting Wong, just, to you, Mr. President. Just resume your seat. Now, when there's silence, we'll proceed. Order. 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 The Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I, I again would invite you to consider whether this is in fact supplementary to a question, the question earlier. Uh, well. Order. Uh, Minister, you've. You've got 32 seconds to answer the question, Minister. Oh, I'm very... Minister. Uh, Mr President, I, th I suspect in the figures that Senator Joyce has just given me, he's probably mixed up capital expenditure and operational expenditure. Um, uh, 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 there, there was an increase in CapEx, and uh, the reason for that is fully explained in the corporate plan. And uh, We will also see, uh, in fact, a, a slightly increased rate of return. Uh, Senator Wong. Senator Joyce. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's one on relevance. The, the question is quite clear. We want to know what the outstanding Commonwealth government securities will be at the end of this year and the next three financial years, taking into account the blowout that is by reason of the NBN. There's no point of order. The minister is answering the minister order. The minister is answering the question. The minister. Thank you. And what I was going to say is the corporate plan also revises the peak equity requirements, the government's peak equity requirements, uh, and and any consequent effect on, on PDI are, order, are factored order, into the Order. Time has expired. Senator Joyce. Thank you, Mr President. My final supplementary. I refer the, to the fact that Minister Wong is a shareholder of the NBN in her role as the Minister for Finance. Why then did the Minister not appear at the press conference with her fellow shareholder, Minister Conroy, to reveal NBN Co's 2012-2015 corporate plan? Was she more about, embarrassed about revealing the corporate plan, appearing with Minister Conroy, or not actually having any of the facts on any issues whatsoever? Well, the, the, 
the minister can answer that part of the question that pertains to the portfolio. The minister. And I'm trying to recall a time when, when Senator talk. Joyce appeared with Mr. Hockey or Mr. Rock on any occasion. I certainly think uh, Senator Connor and I probably shared a, a shared a press conference podium uh, many more times than any any occasion that I can recall with those uh, those gentlemen. Uh, I am uh, one of the shareholders of NBA. I'm also one of the shareholders uh, uh, in uh, Australia Post uh, and the Australian Rail and Track Corporation, a range of other government business enterprises. And uh, it wouldn't be normal practice on every occasion uh, to stand up with the relevant minister uh, on on order. Order. Uh, on, on the corporate plan, uh, uh, so uh, I'm sure Senator Conroy did a very good job. Uh, what I would say, what I, what I would say, order, 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 order. Senator Wong is in. Just resume your seat, Senator Wong. Order, order, order. Senator Wong's got 12 seconds remaining. If you've got anything further, I would say that I'm certainly happy to share a podium any time with Senator Conroy. I'd invite Senator Joyce to tell us whether he's happy to stand up with Bruce Scott on any occasion. Order, order, order. Before I order, before I call the next person to ask their question, I acknowledge the presence in the gallery of former Senator Chris Allison. Welcome back. It hasn't changed. <laughs> Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. President. Senator Hanson Young. Wait a minute. Senator Hanson. Senator Hanson Young, just resume your seat. You are entitled to be heard in silence. Just wait. Order. On my left, Senator Hanson Young is entitled to be heard in silence. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Mr. President. I apologise. I suggest that it seems as though Tony Abbott is running order, the government. Order. 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 That's not in order. Who Senator Hanson Young, who is your question directed to? My question, Mr. President, is directed to the leader of the government. Wait a minute, in Senator Hanson Young. I can't hear you. You need to resume your seat. You're, as I said, you are entitled to be heard in silence. Now, when there's silence on both sides, we'll proceed. <laughs> Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Evans. Uh, Minister, we've just seen Labor and the Coalition vote on legislation to expel refugees, including children, offshore with no protections and no time limit. One member of the Coalition has labelled this as open ended exile. Order. Mr. President, the question to the minister is, does the government agree with the coalition that 10 years is an acceptable length of time for refugees to be dumped on Nauru or Manus Island? Order. 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 The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Evans. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr President. Uh, I'm glad to see you're not impersonating Senator Parry. Uh, you've got far too much hair. No, uh, but uh, uh, I, uh, I thank the uh, Senator for a question. Mr President, um, I think uh, the key point to make is that uh, uh, the Houston uh, Committee reported to Parliament a, uh, a result of their extensive inquiry to try and find an appropriate response uh, to the uh, increase in boat arrivals we've seen in the last couple of years. It is the case, Mr President, the government, the government uh, following that report endorsed their recommendations. It's true to say that uh, uh, some of those recommendations uh, were uh, not easy for, uh, I think, either of the major parties in this, uh, in this place to uh, support. 
but uh, given, uh, given the, I think, the strength of the report and the fact that they came up with what they saw as a sort of a, uh, an integrated and uh, comprehensive uh, response, which focused on regional cooperation and protection framework. The government uh, has brought legislation— Just, just wait a minute. Sen Sen Senator Evans, Senator Hanson Young is entitled to hear the answer without interjections from my left. Senator Evans. So, Mr. President, the, uh, the government has given legislative effect uh, to, or seeks to give legislative effect to those, uh, the Houston report. Those uh, amendments will come before. Just, just wait a minute, Senator Evans. Senator Joyce. Oh, wait a minute, Senator Joyce. After I had asked for silence, you deliberately carried on, and I'm, and then, then that caused another person to interject. Interjection. Well, just wait a minute. Interjections on both sides are disorderly. Let me make that point. Order. Senator Hanson Young is entitled to hear the, the answer to her question without other senators intervening across the chamber to carry on their own discussion. Senator Evans, continue. Mr. President, um, that package will come to the Senate uh, either later this today or early, early tomorrow, and we'll get a chance to. Uh, debate that legislation. But I think uh, it's important to understand that uh, one of the key points uh, uh, um, uh, former CDF Houston and the committee made was that this was a question of being uh, hard-headed, uh, hard not hard-hearted, and that there should be no single focus for policy making, but an attempt to find an integrated uh, strategy that dealt with the issues we are facing, but also maintained Australia's reputation as a generous Time's nation towards refugees. The question. Senator Han Order. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, with all due respect, the, there was a very specific question. Does the government believe uh, that it is, it is acceptable to detain people in Nauru and Manus Island for up to 10 years? That is what the coalition have said is acceptable. That is what Mr. Morrison says your legislation does. Does the government agree? Order. The, the Minister. Mr President, I think the answer is to say that the detail of the legislation we can obviously debate when it comes into, uh, into the parliament, but the basis of uh, the Houston report and the amendments we're pursuing is to shift the balance of risk and incentive. It very much is about trying to shift that balance and, 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 and lead, lead to something being in favour of regulate, regular migration pathways. Now, there's no question that some of the implementation arrangements of this program Just will have to be followed. Wait, wait, wait a minute, Senator Evans. Order on my right. On my right. On. Order on my right. Now, when there's silence on both sides, we'll proceed. Senator Cameron. Senator Cameron. Senator, Ca Senator Cameron. Order. Senator Evans, continue. Thank you, Mr. President. I, the key point I'm trying to make, Mr. President, is the report sought to give effect to two key principles, in my view. One was the no advantage principle, which was to say that there is no advantage in seeking to come here by boat yeah, over yeah. the processing arrangements that would apply more generally before people undertook that journey. But also, Mr. President, the, uh, the principle that we ought to be hard-headed but not hard-hearted. And so I think, Mr. President— Order. Uh, order. 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 Senator Milne. Thank you, Mr. President. The minister is representing the Prime Minister. The legislation is in the House of Representatives. I think we're entitled to hear an answer. Is it 10 years or not for indefinite detention? Order. Order. There's, there, there are two, there's no point of order. There are two seconds remaining. Um, the, minute, the minister will uh, respond in any further supplementary question if there is. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Mr. President. It seems as though the lack of answer from the minister representing the Prime Minister 
can only be assumed that, of course, the government, the Labor Party, now agrees that 10 years is just not tough enough. 10 years is not tough enough. Is there a limit to this government's cruelty that they are prepared to inflict on vulnerable Order. refugees and children? Order. Order. You will need to withdraw that, uh, Senator Brandis. Even I heard that. No, no, you need to stand to withdraw, Senator Brandis. You I know withdraw. That. Thank you. Order. 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 Senator Evans. Mr. President, um, uh, as I said earlier, I think the Houston report and the legislation seek to establish two important principles, among other initiatives. And I don't think the sort of emotive language that the senator uses helps in what is a very difficult public debate. And, uh, and I know the passions are high about these things. But while I'm on my feet, Mr. President, I would say to the senator that I thought her attack on Mr. Paris Aristotle the other day was disgraceful. Disgraceful. Given that uh, Mr. Aristotle has been one of the largest contributors to assisting victims of, uh, of torture in this country and has worked with, uh, with refugees for over 20 years, I thought to have his name be smirched Order. because you didn't like the report Order. was an outrage. Senator Evans, uh, Senator Hanson Young is on her feet. Senator Hanson Young? Just wait a minute, Senator Hanson Young. Mr President, point of order. Yes. Paris Aristotle has asked for humane treatment for these people, and the legislation before Parliament is anything but. This one. That was debating the issue, not a point of order. I call the minister. Order. The minister has 16 seconds remaining to answer the question. The minister. I'd remind the Senate that Mr. Paris Aristotle was the person who helped negotiate people off the Oceanic Viking, spent weeks trying to assist those people. And I think when we're debating the report, we ought to debate the facts and the public policy questions uh, that confront the Order. Parliament. Order. Time has expired. Senator Brandis. Thanks, Mr President. My question is directed to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Evans. Is the minister, minister aware that today is the second anniversary of Mr Wayne Swan's vehement denial in the final week of the 2010 election campaign that a re-elected Labor government would introduce a carbon tax? And his description of the suggestion that Labor would introduce a carbon tax as, quote, an hysterical allegation. Why does the government feel so free to break its most solemn commitments to the Australian people? Order. 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 On, on both sides. On both sides, when there's silence, we'll proceed. Order. Order. The time to debate. If you wish to debate the issue, debate it after question time. Order. The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Evans. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Well, it must come as uh, news to Senator Brandis, but this, this parliament is actually passed legislation introducing a carbon price and uh, and uh, it may have it may have gone past uh, past uh, senator brandis as he focuses on persecuting people without uh, without proper hearing in his public comments but, uh, but mr president we have legislated we have legislated to introduce a price on carbon the parliament has passed that legislation and if the senator isn't aware, I'd inform him that on the 1st of July this year, that system came, came into place. And Mr. President, we did that. We did that because there had been a series of uh, reports and inquiries over many years uh, that pointed us to the need to the need for that price. I remember uh, Mr. Costello, the former Liberal Party treasurer, advocating for it, and then there was a very fine report. Uh, done in 2007, which then Prime Minister John Howard accepted, accepted, and he argued, he argued as a result of that report that in fact we as a nation ought to uh, bring in a price on carbon. So, Mr. President, uh, both major parties in this country have, for a number of years now, 
supported a price on carbon. But the Liberal Party, uh, when they, uh, when they uh, ambushed uh, Mr Turnbull, saw the, the extreme right-wing forces in the Liberal Party uh, overthrow Mr Turnbull and renege on that commitment to, uh, to a climate change policy. Mr President, uh, we, know, we know that now the carbon price is in place. The Liberal Party will never repeal, ne never repeal it, Mr. President. Will never repeal it because they know, at the end of the day, this is good for the Australian economy. The transition is being made. Appropriate compensation arrangements have been put in place for industry, and we will know that this is a good thing for the environment and for the Australian economy. Time's expired. Order. Just, just wait a minute, Senator Brandis. When there's silence on my left, you can proceed. Senator Brandis. Given that the introduction of the carbon tax is just another broken promise in the litany of broken promises from this government, including the broken promise to preserve defence spending, the broken promise to retain the private health insurance rebate, the broken promise on gambling reform and the backflip on offshore processing that has so offended the Greens, why should anybody believe anything this Prime Minister or any minister in this government says. Order. Order. The minister. Well, that's the second senator working themselves up to outrage uh, in the parliament today, uh, uh, Mr. President. And, uh, and can I just uh, just make it clear that if uh, if the if uh, if the senator is interested in me answering a question that is policy based, I'm happy to help. But quite frankly, when you get to the third third coalition question of the day, after doing questions about ammunition for reservists, to then, then come and present outrage. Order. Senator Brandis. It was a broad question, but it was a broad question directed to the issue of the government's credibility and its litany of broken promises, but it is not responsive to any part of that question, merely to cast reflections on the opposition. Well, Senator Collins. Mr President, again the opposition complains, as they often do, to the answer to a question. In this case, again, a broad question, a very broad question, and Senator Evans is being quite relevant. I suggest, Senator Brander, stop sucking. Order. There, order. Order. There is no point of order. The minister has 33 seconds remaining to address the question. The the minister. The minister. The minister. Thank you, Mr. President. I think uh, Senator El former Senator Ellison uh, treated the question with the respect to you and, and left the left the chamber. But, Mr. President, this is just a sort of really low-brow political point scoring. When you run out of questions, when you run out of questions, you get to the third question in Parliament uh, question time. And you try and go on about broken promises, and I mean, really, Mr. President, really, Mr. President, it wasn't a broad question; it was a stupid question. Order. Oh, just wait a minute, Senator Brandis. You, you, you will get the call when your colleagues uh, allow you the call, Senator Brandis. Thank you, Mr. President. Given that we now know what the impact of the carbon tax will be with massive electricity price increases, business and consumer confidence at continued record lows, along with job losses as the world's biggest carbon tax takes its toll across the economy. When will the government stop its hysterical behaviour and scrap— Order. Order. Senator Brandis, I've said it for other people asking questions. They are entitled to be heard in silence. Senator Brandis. I see the irony, Mr. President, of you calling Senator Wong to order when I was Se accusing the government of hysterical behaviour. When will the government no. when will the government stop its hysterical behaviour and scrap this tax based on a lie? Yeah. The minister. The minister. Minister, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Brandis and the Liberal Party's fear campaign leading up to the 1st of July fell flat. Fell flat. They're out of material now because the things that they threatened did not come to pass. But, Mr. President, it is disingenuous in the extreme for the Liberal Party now to pretend 
that the electricity price rises that have occurred in Australia in the last couple of years, over 40 per cent in many states, were driven by the carbon price introduced on 1 July. Everyone knows, everyone knows, apart from the opposition, that in fact the small impact of the carbon price was actually covered by the household assistance and pension assistance packages paid by this government. But it is an absolute untruth to claim that the carbon price is driving those electricity price increases. And when you run out of when you run out of credible claims, Mr. President, when you run, you resort Order. to fear. You resort to fear, Time and everyone expired. knows it's untrue. Times expired. Senate, sen order, order. Sen if you wish to debate this, the time is after three o'clock, not now. Senator Billick. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Broadband, Communications and the Digital Economy, Senator Conroy. Can the minister advise the Senate of the direct contribution of the national broadband network to Australia's economy? In particular, what does the NBN mean for jobs and investment? The Minister for Broadband Communications and the Digital Economy, Senator Conroy. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I thank uh, the Senator for her question and interest in the NBN and jobs. Mr. President, the national broadband network is generating new jobs and new investments in our economy. NBNCO has awarded contracts worth over $2 billion to companies operating in Australia that provide equipment for NBN installation in homes and businesses. Prismium, Prismium, Corning, Warren and Brown are just three examples of the new investments and job opportunities Mr. President, flowing from the national broadband network. Last week, I visited the Prismium plant at DY on Sydney's northern beaches. Prismium has invested more than $11 million to manufacture the specialised ribbon fibre optic cables being used for the MBN. One of those you can see here. Mr. Mr. President, 576 fibres in that cable. Just Sen so you Sen understand Senator Conroy. what this debate is about on that side. Senator Conroy. Mr. President. Senator Conroy, just hold for a moment. Senator Conroy, continue. Mr President, the five-year contract ensures job certainty for the 125 DY staff and up to 50 new local jobs will also be created. And in May, Mr President, I visited the expanded Corning facility in Clayton, Victoria, where they will manufacture optical fibre cable and hardware. Mr President, this company is investing up to $40 million in its Clayton operations, adding around 300 to 400 new jobs during the peak of the MBN rollout. Mr President, Warren and Brown Technologies have been awarded contracts for fibre wall outlets and other equipment. The NBN contracts have resulted in 40 new jobs in their state-of-the-art facility in Maidstone, oh, Melbourne. Um Senator Brandis. On relevance, might the minister, in responding to Senator Billick's question, tell the Senate how many customers the NBN no, has? No, that's not a point of order. Mr. Senator the NBN Conroy. is creating new jobs, new investment in cable plants, and new research and development in Australia. Sent order, Senator, Senator Billick. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank the minister for the answer. My first supplementary. Can the minister provide any further information about jobs directly created by the NBN? And in particular, can the minister provide information on jobs being created in the private sector? The order, order, order. The minister. Mr. President, apart from the jobs created in places like Prismian, Corning, and Warren and Brown, the NBN is a massive engineering exercise. NBN has contracted with leading firms like Transfield, Silcar, Cynthio, Visionstream and Siemens for the construction of the NBN. Today, those contractors employ more than 1,000 workers to build the national broadband network. And at peak, Mr. President, at peak there will be more than 16,000 private sector workers building the fibre network 
alone. 16,000. Mr. President, these contractors will be installing the fibre being manu manufactured at Corning and Prismian. And you will know when the NBN is being installed when you see these contractors, Mr. President, pulling this green fibre cable through the Telstra ducts. And only one thing can threaten that, Mr. President. Time's expired. Senator Billick. Thank you, Mr. President. My second supplementary question. Can the minister advise what risks there are to these jobs and this investment? And tell us how many customers you've got. Order. The minister? No, no. 17,000 again. Mr. President, the single biggest risk. The single biggest risk to these jobs. Senator Conroy, are... Senator Conroy just resume your seat. Now, when, when there's silence, we'll proceed. Now, when, when I said when there is silence, we'll proceed. <laughs> Senator Conroy. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, the single biggest risk to those jobs. The 16,000, the hundreds and hundreds manufacturing fibre is, of course, those opposite and the Leader of the Opposition, Mr Abbott. The Leader of the Opposition described the NBN as a great leap backwards. He told the Sydney Institute, we won't keep Labor's NBN because there's no need for it. The Opposition, Mr President, will not even commit to a network that can deliver the 50 megabit services the Victorian government says that 350,000 Victorians are demanding. That is, Mr. President, very simply, very simple. They want to build, as Citibank stated, a cheap and dirty network. A cheap and dirty network. A one-lane Sydney Time Harbour Bridge has is expired. all you have. Time's ex order. Now, when there's silence, we'll proceed. Order, order. When there's when there's silence, we'll proceed. Senator Birmingham is entitled to be heard in silence. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency, Senator Wong. I refer the minister to the annual survey of the CEO Forum, which indicates that 41% of respondents are less likely to invest in Australia now than they were 12 to 18 months ago and highlights the carbon tax as their top target for reform or abolition. I further refer the minister to concerns from the Business Council of Australia that the government may be about to artificially inflate its carbon tax through changes to international trading rules. Will the government heed these concerns from those responsible for the employment of hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of Australians and rule out imposing additional carbon tax costs on Australian businesses? Minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency, Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. Well, there are two aspects to the question. Uh, the first in relation to uh, the CEO survey. Um, I, amongst others, uh, including the Prime Minister, uh, the Treasurer today, and I think uh, my colleague, uh, Mr Robb, yes, I did speak to the forum. Uh, for which that survey was conducted, and uh, it was a great pleasure to do so. And in, in terms of investor confidence, I think the facts, Mr. President, if I may say, do speak for themselves. Uh, since we came to government, uh, there's been some $919 billion, $919 billion of private investment that has already occurred, despite despite the global financial crisis. So, nearly, nearly uh, some $919 billion equivalent to about two-thirds of Australia's annual GDP since this government has come to power. So uh, the, the, those on the other side 
uh, particularly the shadow treasurer uh, and others, who run around seeking to talk down the Australian economy, to trash talk the Australian economy, do no Australian workers any favours uh, by running around talking in ways that do damage confidence, by suggesting to people that somehow the economy will grind to a halt on the 2nd of July. This really does no Australian worker any favours. Uh, in relation to international trading, which was uh, the second aspect of the question, really, I think Senator Birmingham's way of getting two questions, but you know, I like him, so I'll make sure I answer both of them in the first two, two minutes. Uh, the first two minutes. Uh, he, he, I, I answered yesterday a question about the price floor in international trading. I would refer him to those answers. But I do want to say this, that if he cares about international linking, he should have a look at his policy and his position, because the coalition say they don't want any international trading. They don't want any international linking, and that is what drives the cost of your policy up. And you should understand that, Senator Birmingham. You should listen to Time's the Time's expired. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. President. A supplementary question, and I refer the minister to her statement regarding carbon tax revenue to the Senate yesterday. That, and I quote the minister, the government updates its costings in the usual way in the budget and in budget updates, and that is the approach the government will be taking. I ask the minister why did the government not update its estimates for the carbon price in 2015-16 when it handed down this year's budget? but instead relied on estimates that were at least a year old. Order. Point of order. Mr President, on one occasion there's been a question that, that was uh, Not remotely vaguely, very vaguely linked to the, to the principal question, but on this occasion it is not a supplementary question. Look, look, I'm... Order. Order. No, Senator Birmingham is on his feet. Order. Order. Senator Birmingham's on his feet. Senator Birmingham. Thank, th thank you, Mr. President. On the point of order, and I understand Senator Collins may not appreciate this, but I would have thought Senator Wong would. The initial question referred to the, B the initial question referred to the BCA and to concerns about the artificial inflation of the carbon price. The initial question, if you want me to quote it, referred order. to concerns from the Business Council order. of Australia that the government may be about to artificially inflate its carbon tax through changes to international trading rules. Such an action would have a direct impact, a direct impact on revenue, which is what the supplementary question is about. The two are order. very clearly related, order. Mr President. I'm going to allow the question. The order, order the minister. The minister. Uh, uh, what? So uh, the rule. Uh, sorry, Mr. President. Just, that out. Am I on? Uh, the are you calling me on the point? I'm calling on you, Minister, to respond. Of rule. Uh, the answer to the second question uh, is set out in the budget papers. Order. Order. The minister. Order. If you wish to. Order. If you wish to debate the issue, the time to debate the issue is after three o'clock. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. President. Further supplementary, then, Order. and related to the budget papers, will the minister and the next set will the minister will the minister commit that the mid-year economic and fiscal outlook will, to use the minister's words, update costings in the usual way for the carbon tax? reflecting the reality that no analyst or commentator expects the global carbon price to be at the levels the budget currently assumes for the 2015-16 four estimates. Time's expired, Minister. Mr President, how is that a supplementary question Min Minister, to the primary question? I, I haven't ruled it out. I'm, I'm allowing the question, Minister. Mr, 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 Mr. President, uh, uh, in, in response to the second question, uh, I referred the senator to the budget papers because they set out the reasons for the government uh, choosing uh, to rely on uh, the Treasury modelling. Well, Senator, that's a matter for argument, but the response to it was clearly set out in the budget papers. Uh, the, government, the, the government 
uh, will continue to update the budget in the usual way uh, at the MAIFO at the next budget, which is more than can be said for the coalition, which has yet to produce a properly costed policy that continues to use catering companies Order. and those found to have acted unprofessionally to do their costings, then come in here and expect people to take them seriously when it comes to the economy. Senator Xenophon. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Assistant Treasurer, Senator Wong. On Monday, Master Grocers Australia released a damning report into the effects that Australia's supermarket duopoly, the 80 per cent share of Coles and Woolworths into the grocery market, was having on competition and the wider implications for consumers, suppliers and local communities. Among other things, the report recommended the Australian government reintroduce a prohibition on anti-competitive price discrimination similar to other OECD nations and repeal the provision in the Competition and Consumer Act that allows cross-subsidisation between related entities. How does the federal government plan to address the serious issues this report raises? The order. The minister representing the Assistant Treasurer, Senator Wong. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. I was uh, just waiting for Senator Evans' little interjection to finish because I was interested to see if Senator Xenophon wanted to respond to him, but that is another issue, I suppose. Uh, I thank uh, Senator Xenophon for the question. I also welcome him back and hope he feel he's feeling much better after being away. Uh, uh, the government is aware. Order. <laughs> Order. That's harsh, Senator. It's Order. Harsh. Uh, the government is aware of, of the report to which the senator refers by the Master Grocers of Australia, Master Grocers Australia, uh, and is obviously also uh, aware more generally about concerns regarding the behaviour of major market players towards their supp su suppliers. Uh, the government takes these concerns seriously. Uh, whilst price competition between, between large supermarkets has thus far benefited co consumers through lower prices, people are concerned that this may have been achieved by major market players adopting practices uh, which may raise questions under our competition and consumer laws. And I know our senators in this place would have uh, experienced um, a constituents expressing these views. Uh, the government has amended the law in recent years to strengthen competition law and to provide our, the independent regulator, the ACCC, with the powers it needs to effectively pursue anti-competitive conduct. I am advised that Master Grocers have reintroduced, called for the reintroduction of prohibition on, on the prohibition on anti-competitive price discrimination. Uh, the former law prohibiting anti-competitive price discrimination was the subject of a number of comprehensive reviews. Uh, I'm advised that these reviews found that the prohibition actually increased or locked in high prices paid by consumers and by small business. Uh, in the Dawson review, which uh, was uh, the most recent comprehensive review of Australia's competition laws, it was noted that misuse of market power provisions in the competition laws are able to tackle anti-competitive pricing practices. In terms of allegations about cross-subsidy between related entities, uh, the, the government is of the view that the current laws are appropriate and provide suppliers and consumers with significant protections against anti-competitive conduct. Senator Xenophon. Um, my supplementary question is that um, in February this year, the then Minister for Manufacturing, Senator Kim Carr, stated that he had genuine concerns about the way in which our supermarket chains are treated our, treating our local suppliers. Uh, Senator Carr said, I continue to receive complaints from manufacturers about the way in which contract negotiations are conducted and contract terms are applied. There are many ways in which these problems could be fixed, but there is absolutely no doubt in my mind of the consequence of doing nothing. With this in mind, how does the, what actions has the federal government taken about the serious concerns raised by Senator Kim Carr? The Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr President. Um, I'm advised that Mr Minister Carr, in his then portfolio, wrote to the Assistant Treasurer, uh, noting some of the concerns to which you've alluded, Senator Xenophon, and concerns which have been raised by manufacturers. Those concerns were passed by the Assistant Treasurer onto the ACCC. Uh, as the Senator is no doubt aware, the ACCC is an independent <coughs> statutory authority and makes its own decisions regarding investigation and enforcement. Uh, it's the government's view. Uh, that the ACCC should continue to have the powers it needs to effectively pursue anti-competitive conduct wherever it may be occurring. We welcome the re recent focus placed on the major supermarket chains uh, by uh, the ACCC. Uh, 
the Commission has also stated that during uh, 2012 it will be giving priority to competition and consumer issues in highly concentrated sectors, particularly the supermarket sector. The ACCC is closely examining major supermarket chains to ensure that any negotiations of supply arrangements are not unconscionable uh, and do not involve a misuse of market power. Senator Xenophon. Uh, given um, Minister Kim Carr's comments in February and the release of the Master Grocers Australia's report uh, on Monday, um, does the government concede that more needs to be done in addition to those steps outlined uh, by the minister in relation to the dominance of Coles and Woolworths in the grocery market? The minister. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Well, in, in, to, to a great extent, Senator Zenef, through you, Mr. President, I, I answered that aspect of the senator's question. Really, I think in, in response to the first question, uh, I understand the concerns he's raised. Um, uh, it is uh, obvious an issue, uh, as, as people would be aware, that many people, have, many constituents, have made representations on. The government's view is that Australians can be confident that there is a strong and robust set of consumer uh, competition and consumer laws, uh, and also a regulator that has appropriate resources and appropriate powers. I would remind the Senate, of course, that the government uh, amended the law in recent years to strengthen Australia's competition laws and also to provide uh, the regulator, the ACCC, with the fat powers it needs to effectively pursue anti-competitive conduct. Um, uh, the ACCC, uh, as I indicated in an earlier question, was advised of uh, concerns uh, by the Assistant Treasurer, uh, and I also understand uh, they have called for producers to come forward with complaints and information about their dealings with the supermarkets. Such complaints would be treated confidentially Order. and seriously. Order. Time to expire. Senator Evans. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper, Mr. President. Senator Conroy. Deputy President, on the 14th of August 2012, during question time, Senator Seward asked me a question on a, as Minister representing the Minister for Sustainability, Environment, Water, Population and Communities concerning James Price Point, uh, and I have uh, some uh, answers to table. Incorporate. You seek leave to incorporate? By is, leave. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Are there any motions to take note of answers. Senator Johnston. Deputy President, I rise to take note of answers given by Senator Bob Carr to questions asked by Senator Ian Macdonald. And in so doing, I want to say that in the last 24 hours, <coughs> the parliament should be very concerned. We've had reports of cuts in defence, but a new low has been reached with respect to the support and supply of ammunition to reserve soldiers, and I'm told it's in North Queensland. A common metric, Deputy President, for the measure of how well things are going in defence uh, over many years has been the supply of ammunition. Apparently, it's one of the first things that begins to show up as being depleted in supply when funds are tight. So we've heard yesterday and again today of men running around in training, being without blank ammunition in exercises and being asked to shout out the words, bang, bang. Can I say that the, the, the first time I ever saw this was on Dad's Army. Um, you know, Colonel Mannering and all of those guys on Dad's Army as I were growing up were, were told with their picket rifles that were made out of wood to shout, bang, bang. It is embarrassing. It is morale sapping that highly trained people who are prepared to commit their lives to this country are asked to do that in training. That is the low ebb that this level of government incompetence has taken us to. Can I say that things like the Rising Sun badge on the Australian uniform apparently under threat and no longer being supplied. Um, 51 FNQR, a unit with 33 per cent Indigenous Australian soldiers, um, having their operations substantially reduced because of cuts. I actually heard that one of our submarines is sitting on the hard at ASC in Adelaide and a committee was informed by people at ASC that the Defence Department had said, don't start doing the maintenance for at least six months because we haven't got the money. 
Now, we haven't got the money and we're one month into the new financial year. How can you not have the money in August? In, a, in, a, in two words, Deputy President, defence is an unsustainable mess. Dr Mark Thompson, one of the lead analysts in the government's own Australian Strategic Policy Institute, has categorised defence finance as an unsustainable mess delivered to us by this minister and his representative minister here, who is probably the most cavalier, disrespectful minister in the government. He just waves away these allegations that people don't have money. He's not even concerned that people are training saying bang, bang. He just says, no, not true, not true. Not, I am concerned about that. I did go and ask about that. I've had a report at my desk first thing this morning when I heard about it because it's a very serious allegation. No, 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 none of that. This unsustainable mess is met with cavalier disregard. Army training reserve days, usually 100 per year for people who are committed to train for us, to protect us, have been reduced from the 100 I mentioned down to 20 to 21. Most of them won't even turn up. It's not even worth putting on the uniform for that. Now, Richard Armitage is a very, very respected United States strategic adviser and public official. For him to chat us about the level of spending on defence is one of the lowest ebbs I've ever seen. It's a disgrace. And this minister should be ashamed that someone like that of his standing has had to chat us. But he should be more ashamed because he's no orphan. Peter Lay, former Chief of Army. Jim Molan, Major General Jim Molan, who was in charge in, in, in Iraq. John Cantwell, a very decorated, brave soldier who led us in Afghanistan, says this budget's a shocker. And of course, Peter Cosgrove well-renowned and respected, says this government has lost the plot on defence. No other portfolio had to stump up for this crazy budget surplus, Deputy President. Why was it only defence that had to find the $5.5 billion? This is a complex, expensive and difficult portfolio, way beyond the expertise of these incompetent ministers. Why did they only go to defence and treat it like an ATM? because they hate defence. They hate defence and they hate what defence stands for, the strength to oppose aggression Order. to our Senator country. Senator Johnston, your time has expired. Senator Stevens. Oh dear. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. And, uh, it's interesting to have to follow Senator Johnston and that what could only be um, the most bizarre claims. We know we have shared a view in Australia that we support our defence forces and we de de our defence industries as well, which is uh, something that he just mentioned. But the notion that, uh, that a government would look to undermine defence spending and that we would be starting our, com our conversation and our question time today around the two issues of blank rounds during uh, exercises for the reservists and the rising sun badge just goes to show that really the thing that uh, the opposition doesn't want people to know is the extent of investment in the defence portfolio that's currently going on. And I've just two examples of that, if I could. The first, of course, is the redevelopment of the Holsworthy Army Base, $870 million to develop that uh, army base with specialist equipment for our special air commando training facilities, parachute training, diver training, a six metre deep pool. You know, this is state of the art investment to make sure that our uh, defence personnel have the training um, facilities that they need to maintain cutting edge skills. So, uh, just the idea that we have uh, abandoned defence in the way that Senator Johnson has suggested really is um, an insult. The Royal Military School of Engineering, another $179 million going into that project, which is all about ensuring that we can rebuild the skills base that has dissipated out of the defence um, uh, services over the last decade or so. 
Uh, it's an issue that we've all been dealing with very closely on the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Committee, so I find it pretty insulting that that would be Senator Johnson's attack today. But let's just go to this issue, this nonsense issue that was raised, the question asked of Senator Carr about using blank rounds. Reservists, um, uh, Senator Macdonald asked that question, uh, suggesting that this is due to budget cuts. Well, quite frankly, let's get this story properly on the record. First of all, the Army has advised in Senate estimates quite clearly that there's no shortage of blank or live ammunition, and the ammunition has not been impacted by budget reductions. Everyone has been uh, clearly thinking uh, a, a way around how to reconfigure the defence expenditure. Of course, we've asked defence to find some savings. They weren't the only department to ask to, to find savings. And as the Army has said itself, that this issue about ammunition has not been impacted by budget reductions. There is an issue, let's get this on the table and get the truth out there, there is an issue that in some training areas for Army reservists, there are environmental and noise restrictions, right? And that in those circumstances, soldiers are advised, and it is a general practice, it's called a dry drill, and it is very generally understood. It's a common practice across the reservists, and again, it has nothing to do with budget reductions. And army training, whether or not they're dry drills or whether they're using blank or live ammunition, we know is continued to be very effective. So the, the idea that this would be the critical leading question of the opposition uh, today in question time really beggars belief. And I know that uh, the concern that was raised about the Rising Sun badge, which at the time Senator Carr didn't have information on, that that too was raised in Senate estimates. And it was very clear from the information that the defence uh, officials gave that it was the Chief of Army made that decision to remove the Rising Sun badge from the downturned brim of the general duty grade two slouch downturned brim of the general duty grade two slouch hat. Um, his decision made nothing to do with budget announcements or any other financial considerations. His actual justification for the decision, so that people do understand, was that the Rising Sun badge should never be hidden from view or worn pointed to the ground, as is the case when worn on the downturn brim of the general duty grade two slouch hat. Order, Senator because Stevens, it's your time has expired. Senator Macdonald. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. The Australian Strategic Policy Institute said this. Next year, 2012-13, the defence budget will fall in real terms by 10.5 per cent, the largest year-on-year -year reduction since the end of the Korean conflict in 1953. As a result, defence spending as a share of GDP will fall to 1.56 per cent, the smallest figure recorded by Australia since the eve of World War II. Now, Mr uh, Deputy President, we're talking about the questions I asked today. And the first uh, question uh, asked if the, minister, if the reports that the iconic rising sun badge that's been worn as part of the uniform of Australian soldiers since uh, 1901 were going to be removed from the uniform. Now, I have it on good authority. Forget about what Senator Ursula Stevens just said. She's talking about a different issue. I have it on good authority that uh, the Rising Sun badge will no longer be allocated, given out, as part of the Australian uniform. Now, as a result of my question today, Senator Carr here has assured me that is wrong and has assured me that that badge will continue to be given. And I will hold him to account, and if by asking that question I have that assurance, then I and every member of the Army will be delighted. My second question, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr Deputy President, uh, asked if it was true that reservist hours were being cut from 100 to 21 uh, hours, uh, days uh, per reservist uh, uh, member. And uh, Senator Carr uh, didn't directly answer it, but again I take it from his 
demeanour and his non-answer that he disagrees with that. So again, I am assured by Senator Carr that the cutting of Army Reserve uh, uh, training days to 21 is not true and that every reservist in Australia will be able to get at least 100 training days per financial year. Now again, I have it in writing that that is not true. But Senator Carr has said I am wrong and 100 re remains, and I will be following Senator Carr with a microscope uh, when, um, to, to see what happens with that. And my third question, uh, Mr Deputy President, was about uh, 51 Far North Queensland Regiment, a third of which, whose soldiers are Indigenous people and whose role is to be the eyes and ears of Australia and to interact with Indigenous communities uh, up on our remote uh, borders. I understand from information given to me that training days are to be cut by 75 per cent. Now, the information to me I accept absolutely. Senator Carr is saying that is not correct. And if Senator Carr is right, and I know that he's not, but having made that assurance here in the parliamentary chamber, I'm sure Senator Carr is back on the phone as I speak, ringing the generals and saying, General, I don't care where else you cut defence spending, but make sure it's not to 51 Far North Queensland Regiment, make sure it's not about the Rising Sun badge, and make sure it's not about reducing uh, reserve uh, force uh, training days. Now, Mr Deputy President, uh, I know and have on first-hand authority from any number of reservists who contact me in my office in Townsville, the garrison city of Australia, that in recent weeks there has been no ammunition live or blank ammunition. And so the troops have been going around pointing their weapons and saying, bang, bang, you're dead, because there is no other way that they can indicate that their training uh, is being effective. So, Mr Deputy President, let the Labor Party and Senator Ursula Stevens try to uh, misrepresent the situation. But these are real cuts, real cuts to our reserve training, to our reservists, and I have on record I'm delighted with uh, Senator Carr's uh, off-the-cuff uh, answers, answers he knew nothing about, but he has said them uh, here in the chamber, and I am going to hold him to them. And isn't every reservist and every army member Order. around Senator Australia McDonald, your delighted? Time has expired, Senator Brown. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President, and I'd like to rise to take note of um, the questions today about defence expenditure and the defence budget. Uh, Senator uh, Stevens, in her contribution, um, touched on a couple of the issues that were raised in the questions, and that those of um, blank grounds and also of the Army's rising sun budget. Um, and before I uh, uh, touch on those two issues, I do, did, do want to say that, of course, there is no greater responsibility for a government than the defence of Australia and Australia's interests. Now, the defence budget was developed following a comprehensive review of the department's budget to identify contributions that def defence could make across the forward estimates to support the government's border broader fiscal strategy. Now, the government has made their choices, our choices, very carefully. None of the savings will impede on our nation's defences. We will maintain an Australian defence force able to protect our interests and help maintain the peace and stability of our region. Most savings coming from, come from deferring, Mr Deputy President, some defence acquisitions and adjusting the Defence Capital Equipment Program, but also from delivering further operating efficiencies. There is also planned a reduction of 1,000 civilian positions in the Defence Department. These will be achieved primarily through natural attrition and the tightening of recruitment practices. Notably, Mr Deputy President, there will be no adverse impact on operations. All are fully funded. 
So I'll just repeat that there, uh, there will be no adverse impact on operations. They all are fully funded. There will be no adverse impact on military numbers, Navy, Army, Air Force. There will be no adverse implications for kit or forces about to be deployed or on deployment. There will be no reductions in conditions or entitlements for service personnel, other than those already being considered as part of the strategic reform program. The focus of this budget's capability activities will be on improving air, airlift, land mobility and submarines, afloat support, communications, interoperability and electronic and cyber warfare. The total value of uh, projects planned to be considered uh, for 2012-13 and I, um, is approximately $9 billion. So for Senator Macdonald and uh, Senator Johnson to come in here and in try to indicate to Australians listening to the Senate today that somehow uh, the uh, government is putting at risk um, Australians and Australia's welfare is uh, absolutely uh, untrue and couldn't be further from the truth. A couple of the issues that uh, Senator um, Macdonald raised in his question in the Senate today, of course, was about um, the uh, use of um, using black blank rounds, and of course that has um, already been uh, indicated uh, by Senator Ur uh, Ursula Stevens in her contribution that the Army has advised that there is no shortage of blank or live ammunition. The ammunition has, uh, ammunition has not been impacted by the budget reductions. I think it's very important that that, that is repeated and, and reinforced because it appears that those uh, senators on the other side just don't understand um, when you tell them that the army has advised that there is no shortage of blank or live ammunition. So another issue, and uh, Senator uh, Stevens was getting um, to, to this in, in her contribution, was about the Army's rising sun badge, and she was talking about um, that uh, the wearing of um, the badge on the down, downturn brim of the general duty grade two slouch hat, and as and and as this may be viewed as disrespectful. But as I understand it, the Raising Sun badge will remain proudly worn on the upturned brim of the ceremonial Grade 1 slouch hat in plain view for all to see and reflect on when ceremonial duties are being performed. The Raising Sun badge is the proud symbol of the Australian Army and has become an integral part of the digger tradition. Mr Deputy President, um, I understand that, that this is a change. There is order, Senator Brown. Your time has expired. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. And for many in our community, particularly the defence community, the defence industry community, and those who are uh, concerned about our national security, they cannot wait until this government's time is expired. Uh, we just had Senator Brown tell us that there are no conditions of service that will be impacted. We'll tell that to the single servicemen, 21 years and older, who've just lost their entitlement for a free trip home to see their loved ones. This Labor government has probably, I think, about seven sitting days remaining before the disallowance motion tabled by the opposition uh, will take effect. They have that long to stand up, nail their colours to the mast, whether they will actually take away that entitlement of our servicemen as part of their budget cuts, or indeed whether they will live up to the rhetoric that we've just heard again about how much Labor values our defence men and women. In terms of defence cuts and its impact on training, uh, under the Hawke government, when I was still serving, when they started limiting track miles and flying hours and mothballing equipment, we did have to do exercises and, rather than use blank ammunition, say bang, bang. So as I look at this current government under Prime Minister Gillard, who has limited track miles, mothballed equipment and reduced flying hours, it comes as no surprise to hear that, despite what may be reported through the echelons and Senate estimates, that reality on the ground for people is that those kind of cuts may be in place. We've heard much about the fact that current operations are not affected, 
But we also know that despite those claims, despite the comments about we're not really touching the reserves, what we are hearing day to day, week in, week out, as we go and talk with reservists is that their training days are being cut. When I go to welcome home parades, when I speak to people who are in the reserves, that is what is occurring. And how that affects current operations is that our reserves are integrally engaged with the regular forces. Whether you're talking about the Air Force, the Navy or the Army, not only do our reserves deploy with regular forces at times, but particularly they backfill in a lot of schools. I spoke just last night about the 300-odd reservists who have been called up to work in DMO because their skill sets are required in that technical area. People who are operations officers working with the Air Force, backfilling, communications specialists, medical officers, dentists, lawyers. All of these people support our operations, so it's a complete fallacy for this government to say that their cuts are not affecting it. We heard in estimates about things like the self-propelled artillery, where we can see how this government just doesn't get it. They're saying that was a decision by Army to cancel the self-propelled artillery, and Army admitted that this is a less capable piece of equipment that they're now going to have to buy with more field guns. It's going to offer less protection to the troops and, perversely, because it takes more people to operate it over life of type, it's actually going to cost the taxpayer more. Now, the government says, well, that's what Army advised us. But when pressed, what did Army say? We wouldn't have done this except for the government's budget cuts. So, yes, they advised the government on that course of action, but only because the government cut the budget. And the budget expenditure as a percentage of GDP is now pre-World War II levels, 1938. And if you're any kind of a student of history, you will know how poorly prepared Australia was for the Second World War. The de US Defence Secretary Leon Panetta has said of the US, as they scale back, as they take budget cuts, the most important thing they must not do is hollow out the force. And it's not just the opposition saying that about the Australian situation. There are a number of people who have had long careers in defence, people who have been commentators working in the national security space. ASPE just today has come out with an article saying a number of commentators have expressed dismay with the government's recent handling of defence. It's not just that defence funding has been reduced substantially over the next few years. Most observers conclude, probably rightly, that the government's long-term commitment to strengthen Australia's defence has evaporated. Has evaporated. The commitment has evaporated, and the commitment to strengthen our defence means that their commitment to our national security has evaporated. Aspie goes on to say it's more to do with the way defence is run. And I've certainly got much more to say in this place in the light of the defence procurement inquiry and looking at the impact of government initiatives, the things like the strategic reform program, where again cost savings measures are being driven that are making dissents, make decisions like the self-propelled artillery that is not in our national Order, interest. Order, Senator Fawcett, your time has expired. The question is the motion moved by Senator Johnston be agreed to. Those with that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it.